So Joshua Plotnik, Assistant Professor of Psychology at Hunter's College, City University of New York, will talk about our obligations to elephants, how understanding the minds of endangered animals can help protect them from extinction. Thank you. Thank you everyone for coming. Thank you to the previous speakers for excellent talks and thank you to all of you for coming to hear me talk about elephants. Um, and thank you to Thomas and Nathan for saving me a lot of time for not uh, making me go into converging cognitive evolution too much. Um, but this is the idea that intelligence has evolved independently um, in evolutionarily distant species. And as you can imagine, elephants, dolphins, um, chimpanzees and corvids have evolved um, over hundreds of millions of years uh, separately from each other, but they remarkably show similar levels of intelligence, both in physical problem solving and social problem solving. Um, but just a little bit about elephants so that you have an idea of why I'm so fascinated by them. Um, their social structures are, rather, are actually rather unique um, in that elephants live in closely knit family groups led by the females. Um, males, when they reach sexual maturity, leave their social herds to go and either live on their own and, or live in bachelor herds so that they can find other females to mate with. Um, and so females stay within their family group for their entire lives. Um, and typically the dominant female is the oldest female and she is called the matriarch. Um, and that dominance is um, very stable. So there's social learning, there's cooperation, um, there's complex social problem solving. And so I was really interested in kind of building off of a lot of the anecdotal or ethological evidence that um, has existed on elephants for the past 50 or 60 years and to try and test this more empirically and to try to set up a laboratory for elephants. And as you can imagine, I don't take elephants and bring them into New York City. Um, I bring my lab in, into the field. And so I primarily focus on studying elephants in Thailand and I will show you tons of videos of that today. But in addition to studying social intelligence, um, I became really interested in trying to find ways to specifically take primate-centric or even corvid-centric tasks and apply them to a species like elephants. And as you'll see, um, it's not easy because it appears that elephants are not using vision as their primary sense. So how do you test an elephant the same way you test a visual animal like a chimpanzee or a human? And I also want to kind of, towards the end, bring it back to a general theme, um, something that has not yet been talked about today, um, and that's that as researchers and scientists that study the evolution of intelligence in non-human animals, some of us actually focus on species that are in danger of, being ext of going extinct. And so I feel as a scientist, we're obligated to try and find new and novel ways to take our research on behavior and cognition and apply it to conservation of animals in the wild. So I want to take you through a group of experiments and um, hear your feedback on how we might continue to develop experiments to better understand the evolution of cognition in, in animals like elephants. Um, so the first study I ever did um, as a master's student was looking at whether or not elephants can recognize themselves in a mirror, something you guys, I'm sure, all do yourselves. You get up in the morning, you brush your teeth, you put on makeup, you maybe pick your nose, um, but you take for granted the fact that that individual staring back at you is, in fact, you. Um, and you may or may not be surprised to know that this is actually a relatively rare capacity. Most animals in the animal kingdom do not seem to recognize that that individual staring back at them is themselves. They might be able to use a mirror to guide their behavior to find food or to guide their behavior to recognize other individuals that are reflected back in that mirror, but most species don't see that image as themselves. The only species to date that have demonstrated this ability to recognize themselves in a mirror are the great apes, so chimpanzees, bonobos, gorillas, orangs. Um, Corvid, so one species thus far, the magpie, bottlenose dolphins, and I'm gonna show you Asian elephants. So what does this ability to recognize yourself in a mirror mean? I would love to tell you that we know. Um, there are a lot of hypotheses out there. The, the I, one that I think is most accepted is that it seems to be some demonstration of self-awareness. This ability to be aware of yourself, and more importantly, to see yourself as separate from others, which might be an important component to empathic behavior or empathy. Your ability to put yourself in another's shoes emotionally, to take another's perspective, and potentially be able to act to help other individuals in need. This ability to recognize yourself in a mirror that leads to self-awareness isn't necessarily an all or none sort of idea. It's not that you're self-aware you recognize yourself in a mirror and you're not if you don't. That was an earlier idea. I think now we kind of see it as more of a continuum. So how do we test for mirror self-recognition? Pretty simple task in that you put a mirror in with an animal and you see whether or not they can um, recognize themselves, obviously. The first thing that these animals typically do is show social behavior. So this is, uh, except for seeing their reflection in a body of water, this is their first 
um, opportunity to see a very clear reflection of their own visual image. So they initially treat it as if it was a stranger. Right? This is another animal they've never seen before. They might threaten it. They might throw things at it. They might look behind or over or underneath the mirror. I see this individual. How do I get to them? This is a stage that most animals do not progress past. Dogs, for instance, will show this social behavior. A lot of dogs get bored with the mirror, and so they will sit in front of it and not react to it anymore, but they never move beyond this stage. And what we eventually see is self-directed behavior. So the animal seems to recognize the contingencies of the mirror, that the animal staring back at them is doing the same thing that they're doing, and there seems to be some moment when the animal says, oh, that's me. Things like we do, they'll stick their tongues out, they'll pick their ears, they'll, again, pick their noses. Chimpanzees like to look at parts of their bodies they wouldn't otherwise be able to see without the mirror. But this is very subjective, right? We make a decision about whether or not they recognize themselves without trying to pull data from this. So what uh, Gordon Gallup, a psychologist in the 70s, came up with was what we call the mark test. He anesthetized the chimpanzee, marked them on their forehead with a odorless red dye so that when the chimpanzee woke up in front of the mirror, they had no idea they'd been marked. If they recognized themselves, they should reach up and touch the mark on their forehead. If they think it's another chimpanzee staring back at them, what you might expect is that they would reach out and try and rub the red X off on the mirror. The chimpanzees consistently rubbed the X on their faces. Elephants are a bit different because we don't anesthetize elephants very easily. So we have to come up with another way to ensure that the mark on the forehead is not something the elephant can naturally feel. We want to make sure that when they first go to the mirror, the first time they see that mark or feel the mark is when they're standing there. So what we typically do is we mark them on one side with an X they can see, a big white X. And then on the other side, we mark them with an invisible X. Um, I don't know if Halloween is very popular here in Sweden, but it is in the United States, so we typically use Halloween face paint. It's white on one side and then invisible glow-in-the-dark face paint on the other, so you can't see it, but the olfactory cues are relatively the same. So you'd expect that the elephant might touch both X's before he gets to the mirror, but when he's actually at the mirror, you'd expect that he would only reach up and touch the white X that he can see. This is unpublished data. We're working on writing this up now, um, but this is a 10-year-old bull elephant named Pepsi who lives in northern Thailand. And as you can see, Pepsi has an invisible X on the right side of his head, which obviously you cannot see, and a visible X on the left. Good yacht. And he is standing right in front of a mirror. The camera is perpendicular to the mirror surface. So he is clearly looking at himself in the mirror and then reaching up and touching that X. And this is the next day, so we switch the mark to the other side of his face. This is non-toxic kids' face paint, so kids can eat it and elephants can eat it as well, as you can see Pepsi will do right now. They have a vomeronasal organ on the top of their mouth, which allows them to gather um, substantial olfactory information. And you'll see as soon as he's done touching, he does a really big open mouth as well, as if he were trying to look inside his mouth. But as I said, this is a continuum idea here, right? Some animals show self-awareness using the mirror self-recognition test, others don't. Are there other ways of looking at whether or not animals have either a self-other distinction or maybe a self-environment distinction? Can they see themselves not only as separate from others but as being some sort of acting actor um, in their natural environment? So Rachel Dale and I developed um, a rather simple paradigm that we could probably apply to other species to look at whether or not elephants had an understanding of their body and whether or not they could see that their body could be an obstacle to success in terms of interactions with their natural environment. So a really simple task in that a rope is attached um, to a rubber mat that the elephant stands on, and the elephant has been trained to exchange a stick. So before they've ever come in contact with this mat, they have to learn to exchange a stick with us, which is very easy to do. Um, and then we have the elephant walk onto the mat, and all they are supposed to do at this point is exchange the stick. But in order to exchange the stick with us, because we're standing several feet in front of this mat, they have to learn to get off of the mat and drag the mat alongside them, which is a bit awkward, to exchange the stick with us. The idea being, if the elephant recognizes that they're an obstacle to success here, that their physical body is causing some sort of obstacle here, they should remove themselves from this situation. And I don't have time to tell you about the controls that we do, but we look to make sure that they're not getting off the mat simply because it's uncomfortable or because there are other contingencies they've learned. We want to be sure that they're getting off the mat because they seem to understand that their body is in the way. So you'll see this elephant, four-year-old named Am, gets onto the mat and is told to exchange and she gets off to the side and drags the mat forward. Now you might think this seems pretty simple. Um, we, we, we copied this study or we adapted it from a study done with children. 
Um, and children under the ages of two are not good at this. So they get on a mat and they push a trolley and they're unable to figure out that they have to get off of the mat in order for the trolley to move. It's about that age of two years old that children seem to figure this out, which maybe not coincidentally, is about the same time that children also start to show the ability for mirror self-recognition and concern for others. So just to jump ahead, um, Beyond this mirror test, I've been really interested in looking at different levels of social intelligence and trying to figure out how elephants think about their social relationships with others. Um, I've looked at things like inequity aversion, so are, do elephants have an understanding of fairness? Do they show consolation? So do they recognize um, whether or not there is another individual in distress and do they go over and try and assist that individual? Unfortunately, don't have time to talk about those today, so what I'm going to talk about instead is cooperation. Cooperation is actually, as I'm sure all of you know, very common in the animal kingdom. Species from bees to ants to lions to chimpanzees to humans cooperate. Um, but the different cognition that underlies this cooperation um, may or may not be complex in some of these species. This is a really fun video, um, almost 100 years old, one of the first, I would say, comparative cognition experiments um, looking at whether or not um, chimpanzees in particular had this sort of understanding of cooperation. So, sorry about the lighting, but hopefully you guys can see that. You have two chimpanzees, juvenile chimpanzees, that have been trained to pull ropes attached to a heavy box that's out of reach. And on this box are pieces of banana. So the idea here is that if one chimpanzee pulls a rope on his own, the box won't move. They have to learn to pull together. And what's interesting here is that you see at least some level of coordination in that the chimpanzees are pulling at the same time to get access to this food that's on the box but not necessarily intelligent at this point because um, they could have been trained to coordinate their behavior. But what's interesting here is that when one chimpanzee is well-fed and the other is not, you'd expect that there'd be differences in their motivation, and of course that there, there is. So the chimpanzee that is less motivated because he's full, he's the chimp on the left, has to be encouraged by his partner on the right to continue to participate which seems to indicate, and I think we would need to certainly look into this further, and there are plenty of great chimpanzee labs that are studying this very question, um, that the chimpanzees seem to have some understanding of the need for a partner in this cooperative task. And one of the common themes you guys have heard today um, is that in order to measure intelligence, one of the things that we look at is flexibility. So do you see after you've trained a particular animal to do something, that they change their behavior accordingly when things in their environment change with it. And you'll see that the guy who did most of the work gets most of the food. So how do we do this in elephants? Well, you can imagine that we couldn't find a box that was heavy enough that one elephant couldn't pull it in, but two could, which is what you need to do with the chimpanzees. Elephants can pull 747 aircrafts down runways. We didn't have access to one. So we adapted a study that was designed originally by Satoshi Hirata from Japan with chimpanzees for elephants. So the way this works is you have a table that's out of reach, and it kind of works like a pulley. You have a single rope that feeds through and around this table. So the idea here is that when the elephants approach this volleyball net that's strung between two trees. You'd be surprised, but volleyball nets, uh, volleyball nets act, as, act as really good barriers for elephants um, because they have small holes and they're sticky. So elephants can learn really quickly that things like that could potentially be problematic for their trunks. Um, so anyway, the idea here is that if one elephant arrives at one end of the rope alone and he starts to pull, the other end will become unthreaded from the table. So the two elephants have to learn to coordinate their pulling to get access to the food on the table. We initially train the elephants to pull ropes. We do not train them to coordinate. Um, so initially the elephants are released from this point back here at the same time. They arrive at the ropes at the same time. They pull the ropes at the same time. Not necessarily a demonstration of intelligence because I've already trained them to pull ropes, and coincidentally, they happen to arrive at the same time. Well, it's not coincidental. I've engineered it for that fact. Um, but they pull the ropes. And what we want to do is see if one elephant arrives at the rope before the other, do they learn to wait? And do they learn to wait very quickly? And in fact, they do. Um, the elephants not only learn to wait after being trained, but when we extend the time period so that the elephants have to wait a very a substantial amount of time, up to 45 seconds, which is a lot of time for an elephant, for an animal that eats 250 kilos of food a day, to have to wait for pieces of corn. You see that this is a female who got to the road and she's waiting very quickly her partner arrives. talk about 
about this after if anyone's interested, um, that this isn't necessarily a demonstration of intelligence. It's a demonstration of really good and fast learning, um, an ability to learn the contingencies of a task. So let me tell you why I think this is intelligent. Um, two reasons. One is that although we trained the elephants to pull ropes, and the overwhelming strategy was for one elephant to be released to walk up to the rope and wait for her partner, we had two independent strategies that developed entirely on their own. One was that an elephant that was um, held back, or sorry, an elephant that was supposed to be released immediately to approach the rope refused to go up to the rope. So he would stand at the starting point until the other handler released the other elephant. So he had seemed to learn, I don't e I'm not going to waste time, and this is very anthropomorphic, but I'm not going to waste time going up to that rope until my partner is ready to approach with me. Independent strategy. But another one, which is much more remarkable, I would say, because after watching all of the trials of her performance, I never saw her do anything like this until one particular trial, and then she maintained this behavior for the rest of testing. So all these elephants had been trained, when you get to the rope, you pull it. Right? And as I said, over time, they learn to wait for a partner, and they pull the rope when their partner arrives. But what this female learned to do, which you'll see in a minute. Sorry, I should have cut this video to be a little bit shorter. But what you'll see that she does is that she has learned to put her front left foot on the rope and to act as a freeloader. So instead of waiting for her partner and then pulling with her partner, she just waits for her partner, keeps her foot on that rope, and makes the partner do all of the physical work. So you'll see that it's a little bit more difficult for this table to move in, but the elephant on the bottom is just not doing anything except holding the rope in place. And as I said, what's interesting here is it doesn't seem that she figured this out through any sort of trial and error learning. Um, the trial before this she pulled, and then this trial she stood on the rope, and from that point forward she never pulled again. The question I normally get is, do you see any sort of rejection of this behavior from the other elephant? Does she stop participating? Would be a really interesting question. Um, one of the reasons there aren't that many people studying elephants is that it can be really difficult to get access to elephants like this in particular. And you also, because there's a lot of close contact between humans and elephants, need to be very careful about encouraging um, negative behavior in elephants. So if I wanted to, let's say, weigh this table down, which might be a good way to test whether or not the elephants would refuse to participate if the other individual um, wasn't pulling because it would be heavier and so it would be more effort needed to be exerted. Um, you might see that that other elephant might reject this, but limitations of the study, but interesting things to ask. So I want to finish up with kind of a change in direction um, because while doing these experiments, I started to realize that there were a lot of limitations in what we could ask about elephants because it seems that a lot of the tasks designed for species like chimpanzees, capuchin monkeys, the corvids, um, are focused within the visual domain. So can an animal solve a task that's visual if they don't use vision as their primary sense? Um, and a caveat here, um, while working with elephants, I realized that this was not only a charismatic species, um, but a species that got young children really interested in science. So I started a nonprofit that was focused on trying to bring our research into public schools in New York City. Um, and so we designed an education program that we did with middle school children, 12 to 14 years old, in New York. And they worked with us to design this study. So there is a huge body of research out there on what we call an object choice task. You give an animal two choices. Um, usually one has food, one does not, and you provide some sort of cue to where the food is, and you see whether or not the animal makes the right choice. Um, this has been done extensively with non-human primates and with dogs, um, but one particular theory out there is that in terms of social cues, particular pointing, um, domesticated animals are much better at this than wild animals. And the argument for this is that due to artificial selection for particular traits, um, animals have been, uh, domesticated animals have become better at reading human cues. Elephants have never been domesticated. They are a wild animal, but going back several thousand years, they have a very close bond um, with humans in captive situations, particularly in Southeast Asia. So these guys, mahouts, who take care of their elephants and live with them on an everyday basis, um, argued with me that the elephants would be really good at following visual cues. If you point at a bucket um, and you show an elephant where food is simply by showing them this visual cue, they will be able to find the food. Oh, I'm going to buy that. I couldn't So the moot is pointing to the left. He repeatedly says the elephant's name to keep her attention. And 
consistently, none of the elephants followed the cue. So they chose at chance levels. And the mahouts, the guys that take care of the elephants, got really pissed off at me because they argued that I was trying to show that their elephants were stupid and they claimed that the elephants always follow pointing. And typically, when the elephants are being worked throughout the day, they're working with tourists. And so an elephant is ridden into the river to bathe and typically a tourist will then get on the top of the elephant um, and before they go into the river, the tourists take their shoes off, usually flip-flops. And so what the mahout will do as the elephant comes out of the river is point at the flip-flops and say, pick up. And so the elephant will take their trunk, move it along the ground, pick up the flip-flops, and hand them to the tourist on their back. And what I suggested to the mahouts was that you're not thinking necessarily like the elephant. You're pointing at the ground, directing your voice in a particular direction, and asking the elephant to pick up something that has, as you all know, a very strong odor, human feet. So the elephant might not see the world the same way that we do. Maybe they're seeing it with olfaction. But before we test olfaction, we wanted to see whether or not they were using sound. So what if instead of pointing at the buckets, you shake them? Hopefully you guys knew that the sunflower seeds, elephants really like sunflower seeds, are in the right bucket. There's nothing in the left bucket. And guess what? The elephants were not good at this either, um, which may surprise you in that elephants are incredibly acoustic animals. They have an incredible sense of hearing but their hearing is primarily used for social communication. As you would expect, elephants probably don't listen for the sounds of bananas in the forest. They use their sense of smell to find it. So instead, we do an olfaction test. Again, one bucket has food, one does not. They really like sunflower seeds. And the way this task works is you cannot, there's no visual information for the elephant. I could tell you about the controls if you're interested. The buckets are actually locked. So the lids are locked in place and there are holes drilled into the top of the buckets. So the elephant has, has about 10 to 15 seconds to smell the buckets by putting his trunk over the top of them. We then unlock the lids and he gets to make a choice. And as you can guess, the elephants are very good at this, scoring above 80 or 90% across all of the elephants that we tested and being able to find food using their sense of smell. Now, that's also not a test of intelligence, um, but I think that this is. So what we wanted to do was see whether or not, and there's a lot of research out there on whether animals can tell the difference between different quantities, whether they, can, they have quantity discrimination. Um, can they tell the difference between two and six? two and 10, and typically those are presented visually. If I show you guys two bananas versus eight bananas, hopefully you can tell the difference. And we wanted to see whether or not elephants could tell the difference using only their sense of smell. I would assume that, neither, that none of you can tell the difference between the, these two different quantities of sunflower seeds. So now in each of these buckets you have seeds in both. That's all the information that the elephant needs. So they briefly put their trunks over the two buckets. and they are very good at this. And they're, what's interesting here um, is if you look at quantity in terms of ratio, so really simply, let's look at it as, as if you had 30 seeds versus 180 sunflower seeds, and on the x-axis is the difference between these two ratios, 30 and 180, so the difference between one and six is five, and here, 150 seeds versus 180, is a difference of one. So you'd expect that this would be easier, and in fact it is, but what's interesting is you still have several elephants, including both of the males, um, who are scoring around 80% when you have only 150 and 180 sunflower seeds in the two buckets, a really small difference. So, so I don't have a lot of time. I just want to tell you why this is, might be important. Um, I think it's really important in terms of trying to figure out how we can apply the study of behavior and cognition directly to conservation. If we can understand how animals like elephants make decisions about where to go for food and how to find it, and one hypothesis is that elephants make decisions about the best quality or quantity of food simply by putting their trunks up in the air and periscope sniffing from several kilometers away. If we can better understand how elephants make decisions, why they raid crops, why they come into conflict with people. Again, understanding, understanding the underlying um, behavior and cognition of these animals, we might be able to come up with better solutions to take care of them and protect them. As you all know, there's a huge ivory crisis in Africa, so elephants are being poached for their ivory. In Asia, huge increases in human population um, and, and decreases in, in available land for elephants 
um, has made it really difficult for people to try and find ways to protect them. So we want to work towards um, using our, our research on behavior and cognition to do that. Um, and so finally, just to, to add a point here, um, I think it's really important to also try and work to educate the next generation. You know, we as scientists work really closely um, at the university level with undergraduates and graduate students, but we should also try and find ways to apply our research on behavior and cognition um, to middle school and high school level education because our work is in general really easy for young people to understand. At least it can be explained um, for young people and they get excited and interested in it. So using our research to engage children in critical thinking and using it also to um, develop ways to better protect animals in the wild would be a great way to move our field forward. So thank you to all of my collaborators. Um, this is our nonprofit foundation if you want to learn more about the work that we do in schools. Um, and thank you all for your attention. So thank you very much. Uh, this time we have time for three and a half questions, actually. Not even a half. You say that the elephants aren't visual, but they are. Mm. So it's a case, I suspect, of them using vision in some situations and not others. Is that what you're sorting out? Yeah, so for lack of time, although I certainly should have said that, I show you guys them passing a mirror test, and then I go on to tell you they can't see. Of course they can see. Um, I think the issue here is that um, the mirror test is not necessarily a, uh, doesn't ha necessarily have the same level of ecological validity that some of the other tests I've shown you have, in that these animals don't necessarily come into contact with mirrors in the wild. Um, so when they're only presented with visual information and visual information that is responsive, which is I think really important here, the fact that the mirror responds to them, um, they're able to use vision. Um, they are multimodal animals, they can use many senses or multiple senses, but in tasks that specifically rely on food um, or gathering specific cues, it seems that olfaction, at least in the food category, seems to be the predominant sense. Um, in social communication or social interactions, I think it's olfaction and acoustic information. I think the visual information seems to be complementary but not primary. Does that make sense? In my talk, I mentioned uh, my, the experiments made by my major professor, Bernard Rentsch, who was one of the very first to study uh, elephant from Münster. Yes. And he did experiments, visual experiments, a cross versus a circle or something, and he found it extremely stupid. So your argument is if he had, if Bernard Rentsch had switched to affection, would it come out better? But as far as I know, the brain of the elephant does not have many intermodal regions as we have. So you might say a brain that has many intermodal uh, cortical regions is to some degree more intelligent than one who doesn't have. This would be an explanation why we could switch easily, not perhaps in, in olfaction, but a good wine guesser, I don't know. Anyway, we can, and primates can use more than just one mode. Uh, but any, on the other thing, of course, if you do the right choice, then it turns out that many animals are much more intelligent than you thought. You just forgot that they are specialists for one modality. Yeah, and I, But if you ask for intermodal, intermodal intelligence, then very few animals turn out to be very good. So, so first, I have, I have great respect for Wrench's work because it really was the pioneering work on em, em, empirical work with elephants. The problem is that he chose the worst task he yeah. could have chosen because yeah. he chose a visual discrimination task on shapes, yeah. which I think is it, to an elephant, although I think, I and mean, we don't have any evidence of this, but I would assume they see shapes. They certainly are able to interact with um, very small items. They were able to pick up the rope in the cooperation task, asking them to discriminate using vision when most of their discrimination in the wild probably doesn't involve vision is why I think you see failure. Um, and I can't speak to the neuroscience level of analysis here, but I also tend to agree with something that Nathan said earlier, which is um, it's really difficult to say whether or not one animal is more intelligent than another. Again, what I'm trying to do is see whether or not um, by trying to come up with a novel way of testing um, elephant intelligence or elephant cognitive abilities using non-visual information, can we start to see whether or not some of these capacities that we 
thought were unique to non-human primates and then corvids and then dogs could also um, resist an elephant. Of course.